approximating that, which is by taking out those cases from the sample which in fact had experienced these, these activities or claimed that they had experienced the activities. When I remove that and compare the voting rates with the voting rates that would have happened if that had not been the case, well, this is where we come up with the, an additional estimate, which is also 1.4%, 1.5%. So there is some triangulation, and I do believe there's some other research that others have done using other more kinds of econometric <coughs> techniques, which also point to the same kinds of effects. So yes, there, there needs to be some refinement. The, brand, the band, I'd like to make it a little uh, wider. By the way, we've been quite conservative, for example, in, uh, in the estimates. Uh, only about 10% uh, of uh, those who had not received any effects said that they didn't vote in these ridings. We know that for reasons of sampling and social desirability, people tend to understate their propensity to non-vote. Even Statistics Canada surveys using the best possible methods end up with a double estimate of non-voting. So the, the, when we would look at these estimates of non-voting, they probably should be elevated to adjust for the rates of of non-voting, which is a measurement error, or understatement. But we only took half of that effect in coming up with this to allow for the fact that there might be some over-reporting going on the other side of the equation. But, you know, I think further refinement of these results is something that would be interesting extending to other writings as well, because clearly there seemed to be effects that were beyond the borders that we looked at. And, and just a small point then, so if you take the 1.5 percent and then apply the margin of error, that's where you create a band of 0.8% to 2.2% as the out absolute outside possibilities. So instead of just saying the 1.5%, because there is a margin of error attached to that, you can very you know, strongly state that between 0.8% and 2.2% would be the impact. Could, sorry, could I just make one quick point? I don't want to sound like a total propeller head here, but the fact is that people think, oh, that's not a very big number. Your margin of error is 1.7. Why would that mean anything? The margin of error is not a flat box that sits over the distribution. It's shaped like this. When we move down to small numbers, like 1 and 2, the margin of error for my sample becomes 0 0.4. It, so it is not 1.7, and that's important. And these kinds of designs, when I look at effects of this sort, even though the percentage numbers aren't that great, the significance level is at any conventional level, 0 0.001, for example. Steve Rennie, Canadian Press. I can barely remember what I had for lunch last week. It's been a year since the election. How do you account for people maybe remembering things that didn't happen? I'm you know, saying, oh, yeah, I think I got a call from Elections Canada. Part of the, and I, absolutely, people, the longer you get away from an event, the, there's technical stuff, there's people telescope over, remember. It depends on the salience of the event. That's why I believe that, for example, in the case of did you receive a call from Elections Canada or some other author, I see more noise in the data. There's some signal there as well, but it's a little noisier. But in the case of a question about whether you were told your voting station changed and whether or not that was false information, I think that's kind of a, a salient enough event that it's, it's, it's highly likely that people did remember that. So that's one case I'd put to you. The other case is that the patterns that we saw in both recall and how those who associated with other connections such as your voter preference were enormously different and clearer in the subject writings than they were in the other places that we looked at. So I think there is some noise in all of the data, but I also believe there's a, there, I, I'm convinced that there's an awful lot of legitimate stuff as well. And there are other ways to go back and to, uh, to further refine these analysis. For example, going back and talking to some of the respondents who identified these cases in a qualitative session would be, would be something would be useful to validate this. Uh, just a quick follow-up. In the case of the Thunder Bay employee, um, uh, have any other uh, members of that call center, workers in that call center, come forward and agree to swear an affidavit saying that they heard the same thing? Because, I mean, in her affidavit, she mentions that they were talking about this stuff at the breaks and it seemed to be a concern, in her words, to more than just her. Uh, anybody, why hasn't anybody else come forward on that case? Um, we only have uh, an affidavit from Annette de Gagné um, now. Um, there have, were other workers in the, uh, that worked for RMG, that the Star article, which you may have seen, I think it's February 27th, uh, apparently interviewed, and they confirmed what Ms. de Gagné um, had to say. There may be others that yet come forward. Tonda McCharles, Toronto Star. Um, do you have any way of, you know, this, this, you say about one and a half percent 
uh, of people were dissuaded from voting as a result of the calls in seven ridings. But I still don't understand what difference it made. So do you have any way of knowing if it made any difference at all uh, to a result, to, 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 to numbers in any way? The, um, yeah, I, th I think we do. Um, the, the fact is that I think one of the interesting though, Frank, really, you lost me at cause of connection last time, so uh, I just really want to understand what, the, what difference does it make? In, in five of the seven ridings, the results would be different outcomes. How's that? At, at 1.5 percent. If you do the analysis based on the 0 0.8 to the 2.2, and we do have a sheet that, that shows this, at the 2.2, that would be sufficient to overturn the results in all seven ridings. At 1.5, it is 1, 2, 3, 4, five, six of the seven, and at zero, even at 0 0.8, which is absolutely the lowest possible uh, number, it would be one, two, three ridings. Sorry, so, so the range is three to seven, seven. ridings, there would have been a different outcome. And um, just to go back to Terry's point, um, I assume you have no information or evidence from anyone connected to the conservative campaign to talk about how they structure and orchestrate and conduct their voter ID, vote, get out the vote, any of that. So how still, I still don't understand, you know, you're making a leap, aren't you, that Penner says it couldn't have been possible. But really, I mean, what do you know? You don't know anything about how the conservatives conduct their campaign. Do you have anything to go on to suggest, to link this? You're making a very serious accusation against the central organizers and now the government. So where's your evidence? Well, Penner's, uh, Mr. Penner's affidavit doesn't specifically identify the Conservative Party. He describes the modalities that are used to uh, do something that's common in all election campaigns, which is to identify your supporters and encourage them to get out to the polls in light of the technological innovations of the last decade or so that has moved that activity from door-to-door -door canvassing and volunteers phoning uh, electors from the local riding to the use of uh, companies that provide voice and, uh, and automated calling in very large numbers to electors. So he's describing the way the world has changed and why, the way a typical campaign functions. He does not claim to know precisely how the Conservatives go about this. But uh, this is the basic kind of nuts and bolts of how to run a campaign, given the fact that you can uh, retain companies like RMG and others to do uh, a lot of voter outreach for you. And, and let me just add that, um, yes, I'm, I'm the one <coughs> drawing the conclusion, um, where you have both that evidence combined with evidence that suggests that these deceptive calls were overwhelmingly targeted by a significant number against supporters of the New Democratic Party, the Liberal Party, and the Green Party. That's why I argue that it's leading inexorably in only one, uh, one direction. There's only one other party left. More questions? Can okay. I, can I just ask you, Linda, what you're saying is it's like a one-two punch, right? You get a call identifying how you're going to vote. You say you don't want to vote. Tory, get another call. Can someone just describe that succinctly? Because it seems to me that's what you're, you found. Eh? Yes. The, first in the campaign, the parties are attempting to identify who people are going to vote for. On the legitimate side, that's for purposes of identifying your vote so you can make sure they get out to vote. And subsequently in the campaign, we have people who were called having identified themselves as non-conservative party supporters to say, oh, by the way, your polling station has been changed. And we're not calling you on behalf of the conservative party. We're calling you on behalf of the Voter Outreach Center or Elections Canada. You know, we, and the, the voter identification, I, I, should just, I should just point out that, in fact, I talked to one of our applicants in one riding, and he said he didn't get a call early in the campaign to identify the party that he supports, but he said, this is a pretty small community and everybody knows <laughs> that I'm not a supporter of the Conservative Party of Canada. So he didn't get a first call and a second call, he simply got the second call. But he had no doubt that everyone understood that he's not a supporter of the Conservative Party of Canada. And you got seven writings, it's possible there could be more. 
It's uh, absolutely possible. only won possible. by 11 seats or 12 seats or whatever. Is it possible, is, is this the direction you're heading to overturn the actual election results? The direction we're heading is we still believe that there are other ridings where the deceptive calls could have affected the outcome, and we would very much like to see people continue to come forward in those. Another example is Etobicoke Center, which, as you know, is subject to a different legal action. Um, and it was in court yesterday. And we have evidence in that riding that there were deceptive calls made and harassing phone calls made. Uh, but that's not the issue that's in front of the judge, was in front of the judge yesterday. It was merely around the questions of irregularities of voter registration and double registration and so on. But the margin of victory in that riding is so narrow that we think you could probably have a look at that riding and easily come forward with a very solid case based on the deceptive phone calls, which are fraudulent. But do you think there'll be more than seven? Yes. Quick follow-up, Mr. On technical question. Uh, Stephen Tubman, do you know, uh, do you have a court date and do you know whether the court is uh, accepted to put these all in one common cause? No, no, we don't. The cases are going to be managed. We'll have a conference with the case management judge and we'll try to set out a schedule for dealing with all of the things that need to happen before we actually uh, have a judge consider the applications. Okay. Just a one number question. Do you have a number, just like a, uh, you know, how many thousands of calls? Like what's your estimate of thousands of calls, deceptive calls, if we could call them that? It's, it's a little complicated, but I'm guessing in the subject writings, it was at least 10% of all voters in those writings received some, a call which would have been defined as deceptive by them. The, the range could go up to 15%, but I would say it's in that range. Sorry, 10% to 15%? So there's 330,000. In the seven, in the seven writings? Yeah, so there's 330,000 people, voters in those writings, so it's quite likely that somewhere between 30 and 50,000 received this sort of call. What percentage of non-conservative supporters do you think received those calls? Um, probably over 75 percent. And no, it would probably be higher than that, probably over 80 percent. In the case, depends which type. The, the calls on voting stations have a much clearer pattern, so I think people understood them more clearly. In that case, the, uh, it would probably be 85, 90 percent, about 80 percent to 90 percent. Got the voting chain. That's correct. Change. And similar numbers said that that information was incorrect. In the case of the Elections Canada, it was less clear. It was about a 50 percent greater propensity to get it if you were not a Conservative. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much.